Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Brendan Conway-Smith. I work at the Cognitive Modeling Lab at Carleton University. And my talk is going to be a little more on the theoretical side. I hope that's all right. Now, um, I'm going to be tackling an unresolved question that has been posed by uh, Ackerman and Thompson in the 2017 paper. How are meta-reasoning processes shaped by culture? Now, they point out that culture can make important differences in meta-reasoning process, but they still have yet to be explored. They have yet to be investigated. They further point out that decision-making styles can vary widely across cultures. And even within a culture, decision-making styles differ between those who are politically liberal and those who are politically conservative, those who are more or less religious. And so this is an open question. To what extent is variability in culture associated with variability in meta-reasoning? So we're going to discuss this a bit. And I'm going to submit that culture can influence which epistemic cue a person will prioritize in their thinking which epistemic cue they prioritize. So I'm going to apply Joel Proust's dual system account of metacognition to meta-reasoning. And I'm going to talk about how metacognition in system one is non-conceptual. Metacognition in system two is more conceptual. These two systems have different epistemic cues that they refer to. And different cultures can motivate which epistemic cue people prioritize in their thinking. So for example, when reasoning as to whether a new medical innovation is safe, a culture can prioritize epistemic cues related to non-conceptual feelings or cues related to conceptual truth, and this can make all the difference. Now, not to go over ground that you already know, this, is, this dual system account is about how there are two systems in the brain, system one being, of course, you know, fast and automatic, associative, emotional, and system two being more slow and effortful, rational and declarative. But uh, Proust sort of suggests something different, and I tend to agree about these two systems. Now, System 1 and System 2 metacognition, these dual system accounts have been used more and more increasingly since metacognition appears to have a dual nature. Both System 1 and System 2 metacognition can enact monitoring and control processes, and Proust asserts that System 1 and 2 should be characterized by their distinctive information types conceptual and non-conceptual. System one, non-conceptual epistemic feelings is the distinctive information type that it processes. And system two, uh, conceptual information is the distinctive information that it processes. And this correlates with what uh, Valerie Thompson talked to us a couple days ago about how humans have two outputs, the answer and a feeling of rightness about that answer, conceptual and non-conceptual. And this is something we dipped into more in our recent paper at AAAI, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow and Other Cognitive theories in AI, but uh, we'll restrain our comments to system one and system two epistemic cues. Now, these two systems seem to be sensitive to different epistemic cues, that is, cues that determine whether a mental action should take place, whether to apply more effort, whether to regulate attention, whether to regulate emotions. This uh, is referred to as normative governance, that there are certain norms for each system that each one is more sensitive to. Now, system one is sensitive to cues related to epistemic feelings. That is, a mental action is more likely to take place if there are feelings of fluency, feelings of knowing, feelings of rightness. And on the other hand, system two is sensitive to epistemic cues more related to propositional knowledge. So a mental action will take place if there's cues related to logic, to evidence, to conceptual coherence. Now, as we've been talking about the last few days, System 1 non-conceptual cues uh, can correctly signal the presence of knowledge, but are not always reliable. These can provide a sense of certainty that one possesses information, but uh, feelings can often be false related to cue familiarity and other cues that we've been discussing in the last few days. So strong yet incorrect epistemic feelings have been called by Danny Kahneman as cognitive illusions. Cognitive illusions, things that have a, a strong sense of rightness, but are utterly false theory, miss signal. Now, there are important roles for, for these two information types. So epistemic feelings are not meant to be truth, but they're meant to be a proxy for truth. They're not conceptual truth themselves. They can signal the presence of, of conceptual truth, or as Proust calls them, epistemic feelings are more pseudo-truth. They can provide an immediate sense of certainty. They, they can also result in false feelings of insight. So one of the functions of epistemic feelings or feelings of knowing is to stop conceptual regress. 
So feelings can provide us with some sort of artificial floor so that's self-affirming. We just feel it, we know it, and that's good enough. So conceptual regress, epistemically, can, can be regressive ad nauseum. So you can ask yourself, how do I know? And even if you have an answer, you can say, well, how do I know that I know? And so on and so forth. Versus, how do I know? Well, I feel it. I feel it. It's good enough. That's, that's, that's all the evidence I need for a mental action to take place. These epistemic feelings are self-affirming. They're artificial floors that give us enough confidence for us to engage in some deliberate action or to put forth mental effort. Now, also called floor feelings, those derived without evidence can often be wrong. But on the other hand, feelings derived from evidence and experience, such as expertise, can be quite accurate, can be quite insightful. And system two metacognition can represent which epistemic feelings are appropriate and when, what are the proper contexts, and how not to be deceived by cognitive illusions. So there's an important role for system two metacognition in this sense. So uh, we talk about intuitive expertise uh, in terms of the proper role of conceptual and non-conceptual information types. So in an expert, feelings of knowing derive from education and training, well, they can be quite accurate, they can be quite insightful. They can express the aggregated information of years of experience. So, for example, a veteran detective with thousands of hours of looking over crime scenes, decades of experience, can receive intuitive hunches, and they can be insightful, they can, be, they can make all the difference. Now, on the other hand, a novice, well, feelings derived without well, evidence can more often be wrong. They are not derived from experience or from knowledge. And so, to continue with this example, a novice detective is far better off ignoring their hunches and instead following conceptual rules of evidence gathering, of trying to make logical connections. And so, these are two different roles that these information types have, and it's important for us to understand them, and it can then direct our actions of how to apply and, and which cues to attend to. Now, we speculate that this may help to explain the Dunning-Kruger effect. Of course, you know, it's a cognitive bias where people with low understanding or experience well, they tend to overestimate their abilities or their knowledge. Now, using the framework we just talked about, individuals with low System 2 conceptual knowledge can then default to System 1 cues. Hence, they're more likely to be deceived by cognitive illusions. So this can help to explain some of the uh, cognitive mechanisms at work here. Okay, now we're getting into cultural valuation. Now, we know that societies can hold very different values towards epistemic cues. They can prioritize those of System 1. They can prioritize those of System 2. Now, cultures that prioritize System 1 epistemic feelings will communicate this to their members, and they can communicate it simply implicitly by how they behave, but they can also communicate these, this prioritization explicitly. They can say things like, you can't trust experts, or, you know, you should just do what feels right, or trust your feelings, they can't lead you wrong. Now, this will result in more individuals' cognitive processes being driven by epistemic feelings. And individuals who adopt System 1 epistemic commitments are more likely to halt their reasoning process when they start to sense epistemic feelings rather than continuing with rational analysis. Now, evidence shows that strong feelings of rightness can prompt people to simply just abandon further consideration or logical analysis, and they will spend less time thinking about their answer and are unlikely to change their minds. So this is one way that culture can uh, influence somebody's attention to system one processes and how that can then influence the members of that culture. Now, on the other hand, cultures that esteem system two propositional truth are more likely to result in an individual prioritizing cues such as logic and evidence. And again, this can be implicit in terms of how they, how they live or explicit in terms of saying things like, we should trust the experts or think before you act or Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence to have evidence-based thinking. And research indicates that system one biases, such as the belief bias, can be subdued by instructing people to make more effort to reason deductively. And this can be quite effective in driving people's mental processes in a system two conceptual way. Now, individuals who adopt system two epistemic commitments are gonna be less likely to be swayed by system one biases and more likely to base their decisions on logic and evidence and keeping epistemic feelings within their due bounds. System two interventions. Well, evidence shows that system two conceptual processes can intervene in system one automatic operations. 
System 2 can interrupt System 1 when its outputs would infringe on some explicit rules or potentially cause harm. So, for example, a scientist early in their experiment uh, may experience some feeling of certainty. You know, they just know the way the data is going. They know uh, how the experiment is going to work out. And so why, why even bother finishing the experiment? The system 2 can uh, instruct them to resist jumping to conclusions and to gather more data. So in this sense, system 2 can monitor system 1 and then override it by applying conceptual rules. Now, considering that system 1 meta-reasoning can be conceptualized and directed by system 2, it's not implausible to refer to this as system 2 meta-reasoning. And so this system can represent the strengths and the weaknesses of system 1 and when to intervene. And in turn, these propositions can then be represented by an entire culture. Speaking more about epistemically driven cultures, a system to dominant culture would encourage its members to take reasoning cues from conceptual truth. Now, a society with these epistemic commitments will decree that the pursuit of truth requires that we prioritize system two, that your feelings aren't a good signal of truth, uh, such as in the safety of some new medical innovation or whether one should continue with a reasoning process. But there's also some weaknesses of system two. And maybe you're familiar with the old computer programming acronym GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and that system two reasoning is only as good as its premises. So there's uh, some vulnerabilities there. Now, on the other hand, a system one dominant culture, well, it's kind of what it sounds like. It'll deprioritize conceptual truth and it'll defer to whether something feels right. So it'll signal to its members that following epistemic feelings is the right way to go. So in the case of, say, some ideological bias or some conspiracy theories, ideas can be accepted or rejected depending on just how they feel, not based on evidence. This can then drive people's mental processes. So concepts that are superficially plausible, have specious connections, can cause unwarranted feelings of truth, unwarranted epistemic feelings, which are then mistakenly considered signals of truth. Well, there's some specious connection between two things, therefore it must be true. There's some sort of romantic notion that feels interesting to follow, and therefore it must be true. And so these two epistemic cues can be uh, more or less dominant, uh, depending on what culture is committed to them. So, Here's just a few conclusions, how to get back to some of the main, the main question here. How are meta-reasoning processes shaped by culture? Well, we say that a culture can motivate individuals to prioritize system one or to prioritize system two metacognitive cues during their reasoning. Meta-reasoning research, therefore, can play a very important role in informing a culture and informing our system two meta-reasoning as to the reliability of epistemic feelings when they're appropriate, what contexts, and the strengths and weaknesses of both systems. Now, in turn, an informed society can then educate its members to help them make the most of their cognitive systems. So, of course, this has strong implications for education and can prompt new research questions. So, for example, to what extent can System 2 meta-reasoning intervene in the biases and errors of System 1 meta-reasoning? Which motivational factors can impel people to shift their epistemic commitment. And finally, to what extent is learning to prioritize system two epistemic cues improve reasoning and problem solving? So there are some uh, research questions we can pursue there. And that's all the food for thought I have, and I'll be happy to take some questions from all of you.